Hi, I'm Wallace Brownlee. I'm a consultant neurologist at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery. I'm here with my friend and colleague. Hi, I'm uh, Kate Petherham. I work in the northeast of England in Sunderland Royal Hospital. Thanks very much, Kate. So uh, Kate and I are going to share with you today some, some of our highlights from the recent European Academy of Neurology meeting around the topic of disease modifying therapies um, and a bit about sequencing DMTs, which of course is one of the headaches that we face uh, in, in the field of MS. Um, Kate, I'm not sure what you thought, but um, there, there are a couple of um, headline results presented in um, patients who uh, were treated with ocrelizumab who'd had a suboptimal response to another disease modifying treatment. Is that, is that a switch that you commonly make? Would you go to ocrelizumab as sort of a, a second line agent? Would that be something you do quite a lot of? Yeah, I mean, that's certainly something I've done um, and did quite from the beginning, really. Um, and I think particularly in these times, and ocrelizumab is a quite a good option to have. Uh, so it's, it's reassuring to have this kind of study to back up that kind of um, you know, practice that we're doing already. Um, yeah. Uh, so I think there were two studies presented which were quite similar. Um, there was the CORDS study and the CASTING study. So these were open label trials of ocrelizumab in patients who had failed at least one other disease modifying treatment. And actually, um, it was quite a, a difficult group of patients to treat. In the CASTING study, for example, um, about 60% had failed one disease modifying treatment, 40% had failed two, um, and over half of the patients had failed an oral disease modifying treatment. And for me, that was one of the uh, standout points of these two studies because in contemporary practice, often patients that are um, that initiate treatment are commonly going onto an oral medication, and when um, they fail, it's where, where do you go to next? Whereas a lot of the previous um, trials or evidence in this area has been people failing an injectable agent, which in contemporary practice, I guess, we, we're using much less of. Yeah, I think that's true. And I think, that, so I was quite interested in the difference between the two studies as well. And um, I guess, I mean, the, the, different, the main difference was that, that in CORDS, they didn't look at the rebaselining scan for their results, whereas in um, castings they use the rebaselining and then you know, and then use that scan to judge their estimation of need. So obviously that made the results look um, even more impressive than yeah. otherwise have done. So I think that in in cords where there was no rebaseline scan, which actually probably simulates practice in a lot of the NHS. Would you say that's fair? Hate that patients yeah. don't always get a rebaseline scan. They certainly, do. we always, we kind of aim to, but often and particularly at the moment, patients won't be getting rebase line scans. Um, so yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah, we're exactly the same. But in, in, in cords where there was no rebase line, the NIDA rate at week 96, so coming up two years after starting ocrelizumab, was uh, for, over 48%. Um, and an impressive 96% of patients at the two year mark were free of gadolinium enhancing um, lesions. So you know, really vocal inflammation was really switched off. And I think that compared with the casting study where patients did get a rebaseline scan, uh, done quite early, six weeks. Um, the need rate at two years was a staggering 74.8%. So nearly three quarters of patients who had a rebaseline scan were, were, were needed at the end of year, year two. So I, I thought that was really impressive. I think it's also really reassuring for those patients that perhaps do have, you know, lesions in the first few months after treatment. Um, and I think I'm used to saying, well, you know, that those lesions could have occurred between your last scan and the treatment. But now I think we can even be, you know, even more reassuring about, about, you know, you know, holding, holding our nerve and, and waiting for that second scan as well. I think it also raises interesting, an interesting question around this kind of, um, escalation versus early intensive treatment kind of battle yeah. and um, certainly there are patients who I think that an early intensive treatment strategy with 
a first line monoclonal antibody or cladribine is very appropriate. But some patients aren't comfortable with the risks and they want to go on an oral medication. And I think one thing that I um, walked away from these two studies with was some reassurance that actually, if a person does want to go on to an oral medication, um, dimethyl fumarate or teraflunamide first line, and hold off on something um, more efficacious that potentially does come with higher risks, it's probably okay to, to, to do that. These patients did really well, even though they'd failed one or sometimes two previous disease modifying therapies. Yeah, no, I would definitely agree with that. And I think perhaps, again, talking about current climate, perhaps is reassuring that there are a number of patients that we perhaps held off high efficacy treatment right at the beginning of the pandemic. And so this gives some confidence that, you know, we can see how they go with that. But if actually if they do relapse or have new lesions on scans, then we can kind of escalate their treatment with some confidence that that's still going to be effective. And we, you know, we haven't lost too much time, hopefully. Um, Kate, I think you also identified um, an, an abstract from Italy that looked at switching to oculizumab after alemtuzumab failure. Is that right? That's right. And because I, I think that's a big question, because you're right that in the castings um, and cords, the, you know, most people had switched from, a, you know, an injectable or an oral treatment and only, I think, one or two from natalizumab but actually what we really want to know i suppose is if patients have failed a high efficacy treatment whether another high efficacy treatment is going to be effective so this study from italy was looking at that um, it's a relatively small study looking at 21 patients and they only had a mean follow-up of, of 7.4 months so it's still kind of early days interestingly three of those patients still had ongoing activity but early on after the in, you know initiation of oclizumab so given what we've just talked about one could be hopeful that those people would kind of maybe regain control of their disease um, with a bit longer on treatment um, so I think I mean this is a really important point because um, I think it's, it's it's often difficult to know what when people have a relapse or neuroradiological activity on alentuzumab what the best thing to do is and I think this and I have made the switch, made that switch. So it, and I think the other issue that we always worry about is safety. And that was what they're also looking at. And there weren't any obvious safety concerns, again, with the caveat that that's a really quite a short follow up, but it's definitely something to watch. And I think more and more kind of studies like that will be really useful to guide the treatment of really highly active patients. Yeah, it's nice to have an, another option, I think, in that group, although it also makes things more difficult because I think I already struggle to know when to give a third dose of alentuzumab, when to refer for stem cell transplant. Now we've got oculizumab in the mix. I think it's, it's great yeah. to know that it's an option, but I'm, I'm still not sure. Yeah. <laughs> what, what Sometimes too many options isn't the best thing. Yeah. And, and talking about all the switching, there was a really interesting single centre study from Paris looking at people who were switching to oculizumab from another disease modifying treatment so a switch that um as we i think we both agree we're doing a fair amount of in the clinic um and at salpetrio they looked at 73 patients who were switching on to oculizumab from another dmt and they were particularly interested in, in disease activity during the washout period um, and of course, we, we tend to recommend a washout period when people are switching disease modifying treatments. We're worried about the effects of stacked up immune suppression and carryover PML in certain situations in patients suffering from natalizumab, for example. But I thought this study was interesting in that the, the median washout in, uh, in, in Paris and people switching DMTs to go on uh, an anti CD28, and that was some rituximab, some oculizumab, was about two months which I think is probably a, around about what, what we do um, on average. Um, but what was interesting for me is that about one in four patients who are switching to oculizumab from another DMT experienced a relapse um, during this washout period or early on. Um, is, is that something that you've encountered in your practice, Kate? So it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because I, I like you kind of worry about I worry about the washout period, but I also worry about not washing it out. I think particularly with Fingolimod to, you know, an anti-CD20 or, or something, because I, 
I've kind of experienced the opposite where you've perhaps not washed out enough and then developed with alemtuzumab a um a relapse early on perhaps because of this theory that you get uh, lymphocyte sequestration in the lymph nodes and then they're not available for the for the drug to act on so so i haven't experienced that that kind of relapse in the early stage but i think it is a really difficult one and whether there's some argument for covering with something else well, certainly we've used um steroids as, as kind of as a bridge from fingolimod to alemtuzumab um obviously with no particular evidence behind it but it just it does give you the reassurance that you're doing something to try and prevent you know disease activity it's a really tricky patient group because often you're you're switching them for different dmt because their ms is active and then you're having them on no treatment for a while i wonder you know i was interested in um the the, the data presented from um cardiff and elsewhere suggesting that if you're switching from fingolimod to alemtuzumab, you need to wait to get the lymphocyte count up. So as you say, the alemtuzumab can work. I'm not sure whether it is the same for optimism, but this must get into the lymph nodes because anti-CD20 agents treat lymphoma. Um, but uh, it's another area of uncertainty for sure. A final uh caught my eye and again another difficult clinical decision was um patients with cladribine who um as per the european license would tend to treat more active patients with cladribine who would have failed another dmt level and severe ms and it's not uncommon for patients to have relapses during the first year of cladribine treatment so particularly in those first couple of months um maybe what we call pre-programmed relapses. Relapses are probably going to happen anyway, all the mechanisms are all set up to, to, for that relapse to happen, despite the fact they've been given clatribine. Um, and there was some interesting analyses presented from the CLARITY study and, that the, of course, the pivotal phase three trial of clatribine. And they found out that they looked at patients who were either relapse free in one for treatment or had relapses and how they did in year two. And if you were relapse free in year one, chances are you're going to be relapse free in year two. About 92% of people remain free of relapses in the second year. But interestingly, if you did relapse in year one, the majority of people, about two thirds, remain relapse free in year two. I think going back to one of your comments, Kate, maybe another situation where you just need to um, uh, don't just do something, stand there, and we need to perhaps be a little more, more patient. Yeah, and I think, yeah, I think there is, I think we feel an increasing pressure to do something as soon as something happens, but actually sometimes the best thing is to sit back and just give the drug chance to do what the evidence says it's going to do, and that those kind of studies give us the confidence to do that. You know, I, I remember early on a couple of years ago at the ABN, someone saying, you know, what do I do if there's relapses or, or lesions between courses, and, you know, you haven't treated them fully because they haven't had their full, you know, two years, so we do need to to kind of treat it as a whole course of treatment not you're expecting full control after the first course of treatment thanks very much kate it was a really interesting discussion thank you